Hello, everybody, and thank you for so much for joining us today. Welcome to our Ask, Ask the Expert event. Today, we're going to be learning about birds with expert Mark Faraday. I'm Craig Lamolt, GBH host for this afternoon's event. Thanks to everybody that joined us today, including our leadership circle and our Ralph Lowell Society members. We really appreciate your continued generous support. Before we get started, I want to just say a friendly reminder that unlike us, you're not going to be on video and we won't be able to see or hear you, but we do want to know all of your questions. If you have a question just uh, that you want to ask the expert, open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type it in. Uh, as always, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from, so, so please let us know uh, where you are watching the event from. And if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, be sure to give it a thumbs up uh, because the questions that get the most thumbs up go to the top of the Q&A tab. And I'm going to make sure to ask all the ones that everybody really wants to hear. So please give a thumbs up to the ones that you're most interested in. Uh, to turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. There's going to be two transcription display, display options that will pop up. Uh, we recommend you click on subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also choose full transcript and there'll be a sidebar window that opens up where you can see what each speaker is saying. Uh, please bear in mind uh, the closed captioning may be a little bit delayed. Um, but without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Faraday. Uh, Mark has been the science coordinator at Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary since August of 2007. He's led birding trips from Mass Audubon since 2002. Uh, his current projects involve everything from oysters and horseshoe crabs to bats and butterflies, but he's studied primarily bird ecology for the last 25 years. Uh, he's been working on research projects all over the world. Uh, the Weekly Birding Report, which is Mark's essay on bird life, airs each Wednesday on WCAI, uh, the Cape and Islands NPR station. Uh, he's also co-hosts Bird News, a monthly call-in show about birds on WCAI's The Point with Mindy Todd. Uh, that's that's a lot to say, Mark. You've done a lot of wonderful bird things, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today to answer all of our questions. Thanks for being here. No problem. I love doing these. <laughs> well, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And again, with everybody, we really want to have your questions. So please jump in and, and start asking what you most want to hear from Mark. I got a few questions myself, Mark. First of all, uh -oh. uh, well, it's, it's it's. I'm just looking outside my window here, and it is snowing. It is a winter day, and it feels like maybe all the birds have gone away, and we're not going to see them again until the spring. But that's not true, right? There are still birds out there, uh, and, and on less snowy days, we see more of them. What what should we we what should we be like looking for now? Like what's going on in in bird life? Uh, in you know, we're in Massachusetts. I think people are probably joining us from all over. But what's going on right now? Yeah, good question. It can seem sort of bleak late late winter, right? Um, especially when it's snowing like this, you know, we get these kind of spring like, you know, bursts of weather, and it seems like we're, we're in the home stretch, and then and then winter just comes back. And, um, you know, you've got your your chickadees and your woodpeckers and things that are at your backyard feeders. But what what else is out there in, in the, the wide world? I'm lucky to be here on Cape Cod, we have really good winter birding. Uh, we're surrounded by water, so it's a little bit warmer here. We don't tend to get as much snow cover. And so there's all kinds of stuff here. You can get, if you're a hardcore birder and you know where stuff is and where to look for the reports, you can get 100 species of birds on the Cape in a day in midwinter. Wow, and really? The, yeah, and the Christmas bird counts out here, which is a one-day blitz of a particular 15-mile circle, um, the good counts with you know, 30 birders in the field covering different subsectors um, over one day, we'll get 135 species in you know, late December, early January. So there are a lot of birds out there. Um, and winter is about waterfowl, um, among other things. There's interesting geese hanging around different places that come from like the old world Arctic and then end up among Canada geese in a baseball field somewhere, uh, pink footed geese and greater white friend geese, but interesting ducks, you know, find some open water, any open water, you know, Boston has these great places, you know, go to the, the Fenway and the Emerald Neck, Little Pond, Jamaica Pond, mm. and you can get really close to um, some beautiful ducks, like wood ducks and shoveler, northern shovelers at times. Boston can be pretty good for waterfowl. I kind of always thought they <clears throat> flew south for the winter, but I guess not all the ducks. Well, 
Uh, yeah, a lot of birds do a lot of different things in the winter. There are, there are birds that come some winters, but not others, you know, like snowy owls. Um, there are some snowy owls around this winter. It seems to be a pretty good snowy owl winter. If you go up to the North Shore or nice. like Duxbury Beach or a place like that, there are snowy owls. And they're always at Logan Airport, but you can't really get out there. Um, it, and then there are winter finches that only come down in some years. But a lot of for a lot of birds, this is south for the winter. Um, you know, certain Canadian populations of robins. You can see robins in Berkshire County right now. Um, a lot of people think robins leave and they come back in the spring, but robins are a year round bird here in, in Massachusetts. They could flock up and fly around and eat, um, you know, ornamental crab apples and all kinds of native fruits and shrubs and things like that. <clears throat> um, but also it's not just about the wintering birds. And then here on Cape, we have awesome seabirds. People come here specifically to see some of the seabirds, go out to like Provincetown and see MERS, which are like these flying penguins that we have here and interesting Arctic gulls that come down for the winter. Birders like gulls. The average person doesn't really like gulls, but hardcore birders get really into gulls. But it's not just about these interesting wintering birds that are still around, um, which include some rarities and some things that shouldn't be wintering this far north like we have some baltimore orioles that spend the winter at feeders here here on cape cod but migration spring migration has already begun so there are these little signs of hope flying in on the wings of some unlikely species uh you know the hope of spring arrives on the wings of turkey vultures <laughs> these grim undertakers of the sky they mostly go south of us for the winter but they're coming back now they start coming back in, in late February. American woodcocks. This is a hardy woodland shorebird that um, maybe some of you have gone on woodcock walks, which is a classic thing at nature sanctuaries in like March and April and May. Um, and they're already coming back and male woodcocks are already displaying. Um, uh, grackles and red winged blackbirds are already coming back. I mean, increasingly more and more spend the winter here in Massachusetts, but there is a definite like an, an influx from the south in late February. So there are all these signs of the hope of spring um, arriving every day uh, with some of these birds. And then we're less than a month away from the first osprey. Um, they come back. Wow. St. Patrick's Day is sort of a transition um, osprey piping plovers. Where do the osprey go? The osprey go to South America for the most part. Um, they have this, most of them do the same migration where they go down, they all go through Cuba uh, and then down into South America and they'll winter in Venezuela or Brazil or, or somewhere like that. Okay. Um, and the young birds stay down there for a whole additional year. They don't come back in their first spring, but the adults uh, winter down there and then they come back here starting around mid-March and it's seems like there have been scouts have been coming earlier and earlier so there could be cool. legitimate osprey sightings as early as late february okay. if people document it with a photo if you see one all right we we had a, already the the questions are flooding you know uh -oh. not surprised because we have a lot of people here uh, <laughs> i am going to uh take the privilege and ask you one quick question before we get to them because it's something i've been dying to know uh we have a feeder i love the feeder um and uh we get we're getting a lot of action on the feeder mm -hmm. i added um uh, some suet uh next like a little bit further away from the feeder what i have is a wire i'm hanging it from a wire off the branch so it's not accessible to the squirrels nobody i mean not a single bird seems to have come to the suet like they're the the feeder i'm constantly refilling the the feeder no one's touching the suet. And I'm just wondering, like, am I doing something wrong? Is, is it the wire that I got it hanging up? Does it need to be closer to the branch? Like, why are they not interested? Is, is this not the time of year for suet? Like, what's going on? Why don't they touch the suet? No, this is the, this is the time of year for suet. I, I thought so, because it's kind of fatty, right? It's good for them. It's, it is, it's pure fat. Yeah. yeah. But you probably buy, like, the little cakes at yeah. the hardware store or whatever, the supermarket, the pre preformed. They come in a little plastic yeah, tray. Yeah, not, They're not fine. popular it's, though. Well, I've been hearing that a lot. And I also noticed it in my yard for some reason. I do suet because suet attracts things that your seed feeders won't like. Any of the warblers that do winter here, like yellow rumped warblers and pine warblers will visit suet, even rarely something like an orange crown warbler. Um, and, you know, the woodpeckers really like it. And I get sort of modest use 
of, I got some pretty cheap suet this winter. You can also just get suet from the butcher, just pure beef fat, you know, from the, when they're butchering. Uh, and that's probably, the, you know, if you're a purist, a suet purist. Um, that's, I'm not sure I am. Yeah, I mean, the other stuff, they melt it down and they put in fillers and things. And that's yeah, there's why like it's seed cheap. in there and stuff, you know, it, yeah. it looks it looks tasty. But I, I mean, so it's not the wire. It's, it, like, it, I, if I hang it higher off the branch, it's not going to be any more successful. I don't it's hard to say without seeing your setup, but usually like it doesn't matter. It just has to be hanging somewhere in space and the woodpeckers will come find it. Chickadees, um, they all love it. And this is a natural. It seems like a weird thing to be feeding your little songbirds that you think of as eating seed. Like, oh, the chickadees, they eat my bird seed. But chickadees are wintering. Black cap chickadees are up in Alaska right now, all across the North Woods, nowhere near bird feeders. They are tough little buggers and they yeah. know how to survive the winter. And one of the things they will do is eat fat off of a moose carcass or something. You know, they'll be right there with the ravens and, and eagles and things um, and, you know, coyotes and wolves, you know, picking beef fat, not beef fat, animal fat off of carcasses. So it is, it is a natural thing that they will do. It's just a little more uh, okay. user friendly to hang it in a cage. Yeah. Um, but, but I've been uh, hearing that a lot. I don't, waiting. I don't, I don't have a good answer for it. I've noticed it in my yard and other people have been saying their suet's not getting as much play this year. And I don't know why. So good start. Thanks okay. for asking me a question that I didn't know the answer to. Good job. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a, a thousand more questions. Here, so we're going to jump right in. This oh, good. is from Morgan who says, uh, wondering about feeding birds. Uh, it, it, in this time of worry about dwindling bird numbers, I wonder about the safety of commercially sold bird seed. Bird seed uh, doesn't seem to be grown organically. Could this be adding to the issues of loss of birds in a general way? Wow, what a great question. Any idea? Yeah, this is somebody who thinks about things. Sometimes it's best not to. No, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm kidding. Um, it's a really good question. And I wonder that myself. And there are some sort of dark aspects to this, like commercial sunflower production in the Midwest. Historically, um, there have been some really negative environmental consequences of that, to, including poisoning red-winged blackbirds. Really? To, to protect the... Things are very different in the agricultural part. The middle of the country is very different from the coast. <laughs> the place at the big, where they produce all the food in the middle of the country, they do things differently. And they were like herbiciding cattail wetlands. So they weren't encouraging the blackbird. Red-winged blackbirds are probably the most abundant songbird on the continent. And if you're growing sunflower seeds in the Midwest, they're an agricultural pest. They're like locusts. And so, the, so um, you know, there's that kind of stuff to consider. I have not seen a movement yet to or like organically certified um, sunflower seed. And that might be that might be something that you see in the future. There's a lot of that with coffee, shade grown coffee. There's Smithsonian certified bird friendly coffee, things like that. I have not seen that movement um, in the bird seed world yet. And Isn't that surprising? Because the people really, who are interested yeah. in bird seed are also interested in the environment generally. You would yeah. think that there would be more of a, a, a an uproar about that. Yeah, it's a good question. It's it's not something I've looked into too much, but that might be that might be something you see on the horizon. Is it, it seems it would seem bird friendly bird seed it, it, that might be confusing marketing wise. Like what? Wait, but I'm buying it for the. Of course, it's bird friendly. Um, but yeah, that's that's a really good question. Okay, great. Monica in Newton uh, has a great question that I've actually been wondering about myself, which is why so many robins this winter? It seems uh, like they didn't leave you. You mentioned that robins are around, but are there are there more this year? Um, it's it does seem that way, um, and so ro it's not that robins don't leave. So the robin that bred in your neighborhood probably left. And then if you pay attention and, and it takes some effort, you'll notice that there are periods in the fall where you're not seeing robins anymore. Like your backyard robins sort of slip away and you know maybe a few weeks go by like, geez, I haven't seen a robin in a while. And then when cold fronts start coming in in the fall, you get these high flying robins that are coming in from Canada. Um, <clears throat> and they've got, you know, they've got like a mullet and, you know, they're different, they're different than, I'm just, I'm sorry, you know, anti-Canadian jokes. <laughs> uh, but they, they, sometimes they seem bigger and darker. There are different subspecies up there. Um, but we get robins from further north that come in during the winter. 
um, and they move around. They they are in search of grass when there's no when there's no snow they'll feed on lawns and you know grassy areas just like they would in breeding season but in flocks um, and then other times they're feeding on fruit and hmm. things like ornamental crab apples winter berry um, they like invasive things like multiflora rose and privet and things like that they sort of help spread those around but they become largely frugivorous in the winter and they are gregarious, gregarious and frugivorous. <laughs> uh, they have excellent vocabularies too. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, they're always they're always here, but they the numbers do vary. The high count for a single roost in Barnstable, um, which is sort of near the great marshes of Barnstable behind Sandy Neck, where there's lots of good habitat, lots of thickets with a lot of fruit, places for them to roost. Um, the high count ever was like 88,000 robins going into that roost on a late December evening. What? That's crazy. Sometimes it seems like there are more robins in the winter than in the summer because they're more concentrated and you'll yeah. see a lot all at one time, but it's, it's hard to say, but, but is there a reason here, that they like to gather together in the winter time or. I think it's because they're using shared resources. They don't mm -hmm. territoriality breaks down because they're not defending breeding territories. And um, birds that eat fruit tend to be in flocks, cedar wax wings. Um, even, you know, you see it a lot with starlings. Starlings are competing with these native species for some of these fruits. And they're in big flocks feeding on cedar fruits, like Eastern red cedar fruits, just like the robins and wax wings. And bluebirds um, are also eating these, these fruits. Uh, but in the, in the Boston area, you might see um, European starlings also filling that niche of the flocking frugivores, the gregarious yeah. frugivorous among us. Flocking frugivores. We, we had a, a million more questions, so I'm going I'm to jump through here. A um, uh, great question um, from uh, Pam, who wants to know, why won't juncos fly to the bird feeder and only feed on the ground? I will say, actually, that I've seen juncos in my feeder, I think, briefly, but I do think that they're, they're more interested in the stuff that's fallen on the ground, too. Yeah, most sparrows prefer to feed on the ground. That's just, it's how they are. They're very stubborn. Uh, <laughs> but more and more, I see that the song sparrows in my yard, they know about, they'll fly up to the feeder and, and use it. But overwhelmingly, they feed on the ground. They'll mm -hmm. scratch around in the leaf litter. They're eating natural seeds that they're finding on the ground, weed seeds that fell to the ground. Um, and they're eating insects that they can find in the leaf litter. Leaf litter is really important to a lot of different birds if you watch them. And so hopefully you can have places in your yard where you can leave the leaves, which is a, 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 a very common meme you see in, in various like social media groups around bird friendly, you know, whatever, pollinator gardening and that sort of thing. And that is important. The, the leaf litter is very important. Um, but it's just, it's just their niche, right? They're sparrows are ground feeders. And so what I will typically do is I'll buy a, a, some cheap kind of millet, you know, the cheap bird seed mix that is mostly red and white millet. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I'll keep some of that on hand and I'll throw a couple of handfuls on the ground for things like morning doves, but mostly sparrows that, that prefer to feed on the ground. Okay. All right. And um, juncos are juncos are sparrows, to be clear. I actually did not realize that they are sparrows, yeah. but um, they're really beautiful. I, I was pretty happy with, to see them in, at, at our backyard um, on the ground, mostly. Um, great question from Carolyn Abingdon which says, we're seeing a lot of finch couples at our feeders. Do they mate for life or have they already chosen mates for this season? The finches, so probably talking about house finches, uh, I'm guessing it's not as easy to tell male and female American goldfinches apart this time of year. Yeah, the house finches you can tell because the they're, finch they're a little more red the, on the, the male. Yes, nose. the males yeah. have a red head, and so you can tell them apart year round. I'm not seeing that. I'm just seeing little groups. Um, I have house finches every day, and they're just in little groups. I, I've not seen pairing behavior, but um, it's a good question. I don't know if they mate for life. Songbirds don't mate for life as often as bigger birds like osprey do. It's till death do us part with ospreys and eagles. Um, but with the songbirds, it's a little more like it's like the 60s, you know, it's like they're having key parties and whatever, but, but they're a little more likely to switch mates and be um, 
promiscuous and, and that sort of thing. I don't know, I have not looked into that specifically with, with house finches, but I have heard more song. There's more bird song in general and house finches are part of that mm -hmm. chorus of birds who the increasing daylight, like uh, I'm sure we're all noticing there's increasing daylight yeah. and that affects the, your, your pineal gland and it, it affects your endocrine system. Um, probably helps us <laughs> our mood, but with birds, it turns on their the birds the singing part of their brain, and so you're probably noticing you'll hear cardinals singing this time of year in the middle of the snowstorm. It's yeah. got nothing to do whether it's a nice sunny day or not. It's about day length, and they're just they can't help it. It's just the hormones and house finches are part of that, so they're singing more. But um, they might be thinking a lot of birds are thinking about their mates during the winter ducks. Yes, you can see ducks displaying all winter long, doing um, crazy head tossing displays and things like that. If you're watching ducks, so um, house finches might might be one of those. I, you know, I mean, it's it's snowing now, but it was it was 65 degrees and sunny a couple of days ago. Right. And when I walked outside, it sounded like, and I, I, maybe it was not because I was more sort of open to hearing it because I was so excited about the weather. But it it, it was almost deafening how much bird call I was hearing all around me it is am I imagining that or are they like look how nice it is and, and just singing about it there, there does seem to be a hey it's a nice day component to it for some yeah. of the birds um, and so it's yeah it's two it's two different things happening but you will you will notice that it's happening in crap weather too <laughs> and because it really is hormonal its structures in the brain are physically changing I mean birds are crazy they have to go through puberty every year I'm, you know, day length changes their endocrine system, which kind of shuts down their reproductive system for the winter in a lot of species. And then it has to kind of, they get shrinkage in the winter. And then that has to like regrow again and increasing day length drives that through the endocrine system. It, it's really cool that uh, it's very adaptive that, you know, they put resources into other things in the winter and, you know, leave, <laughs> leave aside uh, thoughts uh, you know, of the fairer sex or whatever for, for spring uh, when there's more resources and, and they can um, focus on that more. You know, that, I think that's one of the things I love about birds is that like, I didn't know that. And you just, I feel like I'm constantly learning new things from, from conversations like this. That's, a, that's amazing. I did not Me realize too. that they do that every year. <laughs> um, question from uh, Jeanette says, I think recently on the bird report, you mentioned that bald eagles are on the cave. And now I haven't been able to find it again. I think she's looking for the story on, on the site uh, or maybe she's looking for bald eagles, but she's, cause she says, can you tell us if they're still around and if so, where? Thank you. Bald eagles, good. Um, I wanted to talk about them anyway. Um, so bald, this is a great time, probably the best time of year to see bald eagles in Massachusetts is midwinter. And midwinter is when the state wildlife agency, Mass Wildlife, who likes to keep track of nesting bald eagles, will typically do a, a survey, like a hardcore survey where they're getting in planes and flying around Quabbin Reservoir, uh, looking, you know, checking on old nests and looking for new nests. <clears throat> the bald eagle is a huge success story of um, the kind of the post DDT era, the banning of DDT, and then biologists, you know, bringing them back by bringing up young from other regions and hacking them in nests at the Quabbin. So, um, the bald eagle population in Massachusetts is a, is a great success story. Uh, sort of an, a partnership between Mass Wildlife and Mass Audubon was involved back in the day, but now they're just commonplace. Uh, you know, they're just flying around. I know someone who lives uh, lives in the a Boston suburb. They live in Belmont, and they just a little tiny postage stamp yard, and they had bald eagles walking around in the snow a few weeks ago. Um, so they're around, and ice ponds that are partially iced over with some open water are great places to see eagles. The Merrimack River is sort of the classic place, you know, up in Newburyport and upriver from there. Um, great place to see eagles in the winter. Um, and there are certain places here on the Cape, there's a pond near me, Long Pond in Harwich. Um, there were as many as seven bald eagles using, using that pond a few weeks back. Wow. Somebody had a picture of five young, immature bald eagles don't have the white head or tail right. for about five years. Uh, they grow up. <laughs> it takes them five years to grow up and get that class iconic white head and tail. And so you had these five young ones and then there was a pair of adults. And so at least seven eagles just on one pond just out here in, in Harwich, um, out on the Cape. So, um, you know, big reservoirs, places with some open water where they can 
hunt waterfowl and fish um, are good good places to see eagles. But they're around they're around Boston, and every year they get a little easier to see. They're just um, an increasing population, which is just awesome. That's great news. Yeah, uh, Mark wants to know what are the birds. Um, oh, I lost Mark's question here. Uh, Mark wants to know what do the birds do in weather like today? Do they shelter themselves or continue? Uh, as if it's a regular day. And again, uh, if, if anybody's tuning in from elsewhere, it's, uh, the snow's coming down pretty hard right now. Right. Yeah, we're probably getting less here on the Cape. It's sort of, you know, a f few inches maybe. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we're, we're in our cozy houses and we look out the window and like, what are they doing out there? These tiny yeah. little birds. Um, and, and they're using a, a variety of strategies food is the most important thing when it's cold. So the, the best studied example is probably black cap chickadees, our state bird. Little tiny nothing of a bird um, that has to survive freezing cold nights. I mentioned earlier how they're wintering like way north, places where it's routinely well below zero. Mm -hmm. And so the way they survive in these places is by eating a lot. And so they have to gain something like, they have to increase their weight by 10% every day and then every, they lose they lose every day and then they lose 10 literally they're yo-yo dieting on a daily time scale and wow. so just sitting on their perch at night they find somewhere out of the out of the wind or chickadees are probably um, roosting in cavities like inside holes and in trees during the night to get out of the wind and conserve heat they fluff up um a lot of birds can drop their metabolism but they're still burning through 10 percent of their weight on a really cold night and then they have to gain that back and if they don't it's fatal and so it it's about food and so they do have to go out and forage um if if some birds have enough fat stores they can sort of sit it out and, and just shelter if it's really nasty but at some point they're going to have to find some food and this is why some birds cache food you might see birds you know um chickadees and nuthatches and, and woodpeckers and and jays and other corvids will will cache food meaning they'll take it and put it somewhere and hopefully remember where it is and some of the corvids have prodigious memories just incredible memories for where they've stashed things like this bird called the clark's nutcracker which is a relative of jays and crows out west can remember the locations of hundreds of you know pine nuts and things that they've stashed um, and so there are a lot of different strategies but it's what they do. It's what they do for a living. Um, you know, they've evolved to be able to just survive snowy, cold weather, um, and, and they know what they have to do, and, and they do it. Pam wants to know, why do all the birds like yellow goldfinches come at the same time to feed? It seems that way. Um, but yeah, there, there's, a, there's this mixed flock effect, um, particularly in the winter, where it seems like these groups of unrelated birds um, hang out together. Um, and that happens in the tropics too. Mixed flocks are, are um, a big thing in the tropics where they move around looking for ant swarms or looking for fruiting trees. And it's just a, a group of birds all looking for the same resource and benefiting from lots of different eyes, finding some fruit that they wouldn't have noticed by themselves or some seeds. And because they're not territorial, they're not, def again, they're not defending nesting ter territories in the winter. Mm -hmm. They just don't have that um, behavioral component. So, so they're like bluebirds and goldfinches and house finches and pine warblers will flock together in the winter. So, you know, it's bluebirds and pine warblers are less common than the other ones. Um, but but that's a thing that we'll see on the Cape. Uh, and then there'll be a couple of yellow rumped warblers mixed in, you know, the robins will flock with wax wings. They're, they're both of those species are into fruit, but in terms of them all coming to your feeders at the same time, it does seem like that sometimes. If you watch your feeders all day, there are some species that are just sort of around and maybe don't move with the flock and they come on their own schedule. And then all of a sudden you've got every bird in the neighborhood is at yeah. your feeders for about, 20 to 30 minutes. I feel like um, I, I put the, the seed out and sometimes it takes a couple of days before anybody really realizes that it's there. And then it's like the word gets out. It's, you know, they're all yeah. like, Hey, Hey, come on over, you know, and all different species too. Right. But it, it takes a little while uh, for them to realize that. Yeah. There are a lot of birds that 
they cue into the behavior of other birds. So they benefit from these mixed flocks. Everybody benefits from being able to find food. And then there's, you know, some protection from predators because 20 birds, if you have 20 birds, one of them is more likely to pick up that a Cooper's hawk is about to come in and nail one of them and give an alarm call than if it's just one bird by themselves. So, you know, presumably there are these benefits to this that, that um, seem fairly obvious when you, when you think about it. Um, initially, you might be like, why wouldn't they want to not make the other birds aware of scarce food resources? Uh, but there are definite benefits to doing it. And you see it in a lot of different groups of birds, wading birds, like think of big flocks of egrets. They're moving around like the Florida Everglades looking for white. And because white means there are other egrets feeding yeah. on fish. And so they'll cover, you know, tens of square miles, uh, sometimes more, and they'll see white. And you can attract egrets in the Everglades. I participated in a study back when I was just out of college. You could put out a bunch of white paper plates in the Everglades, and that will bring in egrets because they're looking, they, they key in on that white, which tells them there's fish because there are other egrets. Yeah, but that's not very nice because they, you know, yeah, yeah. They, they get there and they're all bummed out. Yeah. Uh, Pat, Patty wants to know. Uh, this is this is a question uh, that I have as well. She says the, the the sparrows and the doves have really taken over my yard and feeders, and nobody else comes. She says I love sparrows, but what else can I do to entice others? Yeah, it, it's hard. I, to I have mostly these... sparrows too. Yeah, you by sparrows, I'm guessing probably a lot of Boston people, city people, you're talking about house sparrows. Yeah, um, that's what I got. Right, which which are not sparrows. They're like an old world weaver finch. You know, they're not related to our native sparrows, like song okay. sparrows. Okay. Um, they're just a very successful bird that's been introduced all over the world. It's originally a, a Eurasian species um, and they do very well in, in urbanized areas. Um, they, don't, they don't seem to like just regular sunflower seed in the shell um, they if you're putting out cheap seed the millet type seed that they seem to like that better mm -hmm. you can probably cut down on their visits if you use you know black oil sunflower seed um if you really and i don't know what the landscape context is of your house and like what other birds are around that might come in usually they'll come in if there's food regardless of the house sparrows but there are you can look online, people have done things like hanging little monofilament lines from the bird feeders. For some reason, house sparrows don't seem to like that. Hmm. That has also worked for people in discouraging the house sparrows from getting into bluebird boxes. House sparrows are a big problem if you have bird houses that you're managing for things like bluebirds and tree swallows, as a lot of us do, um, and because they will kill the bluebird, the, especially the young bluebirds, they'll um, break the eggs and things like that. Wow. So house sparrows were, are a big problem and they were a big problem, a big reason why bluebirds had declined um, like earlier last century. Wow. Um, and, and people have used the monofilament trick to, to keep them away from um, birdhouses. So, you know, there are things you can find online. You just hang it off the bottom? You hang it like either side of the entrance hole to the birdhouse, oh. and there, you know, there you can look this up online. Various places, like um, for that particular thing, that's a little bit tangential to the question. But if you manage birdhouses, uh, that's something you can find on Cornell's project. Nest Watch has the best um, information about you know managing nest boxes for different species, and you can find stuff there on that. Um, but at feeders, you, you, I'm sure you can find all kinds of videos and things of people um case studies where, where that's worked or hasn't worked but you know try some black oil sunflower seed which is just the standard thing that like chickadees and titmice and even woodpeckers and things like maybe try some suet i haven't seen house sparrows use suet so much um that should might bring in some woodpeckers and more interesting things yeah, nothing to use my suet but you know yeah, i know I'll... maybe this isn't the winter to, to start <laughs> trying suet all right. Well, we got just so many fantastic questions from the audience and, and we have time for a, a lot more. Um, but I want to take a quick moment to introduce my colleague, Sandy. Sandy, uh, hey. Hello, Craig. Hello, Mark. And hello to everyone at home. I'm Sandy Chin with GVH's Leadership Circle and Member Engagement. And there's always something for everyone on GVH from virtual events about birds to Big Bird himself. And the number of programs offered by our station is directly related to the amount of money our members give. 
And today, if you're able to give $7.50 a month as a sustaining member, or give $90 all at once, we will send you a copy of George Harrison's Garden Birds of America, a gallery of garden birds and how to attract them. This is a vivid color portfolio of 60 of America's most popular, most interesting, most colorful garden birds and full of facts described in clear details for the genuine birder or backyard watcher. And with information on which ingredients attract birds, what to plant, bird feeders, house, uh, houses and baths, and who eats what. It's a great companion to all that you're hearing about today. Donate now or learn more about our feathered friends while giving to GBH. And there are three ways to give. You can visit gbh.org slash support events or text GBH to 800-204-3811 using the keyword GBH to donate. Well, go ahead and scan that QR code right here to open the secure donation form on your smartphone. GBH members help us reach new heights and deliver great programs to the communities we serve. And if you're already a GBH member, thank you for your contribution. If you wish to become one this afternoon, just click on that link in the Zoom chat now or text GBH to 800-204-3811 or go ahead and scan that QR code right here on your screen. It's financial assistance from members that help us fund lifelong learning and thoughtful community conversations like this one today. In short, it's viewers and listeners who give us wings and GBH can't fly without you. So thank you. And now back to Craig with more of your questions for Mark. Great, thank you so much, Sandy. That book does sound like the perfect uh, complement to our conversation today. A lot of the questions that we've been talking about, Mark, uh, and and really uh, by giving to GBH uh, and getting that book, you, you really support events like this and, and so many other things that GBH does. So thank you so much for contributing. Mark, we got, again, tons more questions. We have a question about bird houses here. Uh, that, um, uh, let's see, I, I uh, moved, lost. We got a few wooden birdhouses, says Sue. And she says, for the average yard feeder birds here in Falmouth, uh, do you have advice about where to place them? Where to put the bird houses? Bird wooden houses, bird house. right, right. Yeah. Wooden bird houses. <clears throat> um, the best place is on a pole with a predator guard, hmm. um, and so that will keep raccoons. We we've had a lot of problems with raccoons here at. So I'm at Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary is where I'm coming at you from here. Uh, the, cr the crown jewel of, of the Mass Audubon kingdom, as I always like to say. Uh, and, you know, we have tons of bird boxes and we have volunteers um, who help us monitor those. And we send all the data to Cornell's Nest, Nest Watch, uh, which I referenced earlier, which is a great, great program through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and there's lots of good information there about this kind of thing. I sort of lazily just screwed mine to trees at my house and that's been fine. Um, the one right outside my bedroom window gets tufted titmice use it every year and there have been no uh, predator issues for, for whatever reason, but sometimes there are. And um, having a predator guard, like a bat stove top, um, stove pipe baffle on a metal pole with the birdhouse on the top is the classic um, kind of predator deterring way to have a, a nest box if you're trying to attract bluebirds. You know, if you have big open grassy areas, then you have a good chance that you could attract some bluebirds. You have to be prepared for the house sparrows. You're mm. going to get the house sparrows, you need a plan. And what we do at the sanctuary, because they're, they're an invasive species, you have to make, you, we can't be contributing to their population because they have negative impacts on native species. And so, we make fake house sparrow eggs out of modeler's clay. And we, we put those, we replace their eggs with those, which just seems mean, just seems yeah. like a pretty trick. But we're not killing them. We're not killing the sparrows. Like, you know, in the old days, you know, people just, you know, um, but it tricks them. They leave the other birds alone and they don't fledge any young. Right. So you're not contributing to the house sparrow population that we have so many boxes here that they'll just stay in their box with the fake eggs and they they won't bother the bluebirds. And we also have purple martins here at Wealthy Bay Sanctuary um, and the house sparrows will bother them, too. Um, and we've had some mortality in in our gourds. They nest in these white plastic gourds. Um, they're colonial nesters. They're really cool birds, big, beautiful 
glossy purple blue swallows that migrate to the Amazon in the winter. And um, if you live near a big open area near water, you could have you could have purple martin houses too. Um, but away, like out in the open, if you're going for bluebirds on a post predator guard, if you're just you know chickadees, whatever you want to get, whatever's in your yard, it's more wooded. I've had I've had decent luck hanging them on a tree, but I've had to hang like four boxes to get one of them to be used. And my I've never had bluebirds, even though they do nest in my neighborhood. Um, and I have I have a screech owl box, and I've had screech owls in it, but they haven't nested. Mostly, you often get squirrels in those. And then last year I got a great crested flycatcher box, which is bigger than a bluebird box. They're, they're a flycatcher, that beautiful, fun flycatcher that nests in uh, woodlands in, in old woodpecker cavities. And you can get these specific uh, houses specific for them. I got mine from Birdwatcher's General Store out here in, out here in Orleans, great little place. Um, and that, they, they thumbed their nose at it and tried, they were more interested in a screech owl box that had squirrels in it. So sometimes the birds are not that bright, <laughs> you know, like here's a, it's said right on the label, great crested flycatcher box. It's right there. It's empty. <laughs> Why are you trying to get in the box that is full to the brim with squirrels? <laughs> uh, but anyway, you know, you have to just try no a few with them. Yep. Get a few, try them and try them in different places. Be prepared to manage house sparrows and just have fun with it. And if you want, you can um, submit the data to um, Cornell's Nest Watch. Cool. I, so I, I built one last year, but I was still building it when spring came and then I hung it up on a tree <laughs> and nobody has moved into it. And I was yeah. all disappointed, but, but I realized I was too late. And, and yeah. I, I think, and I've just left it up there. I didn't take it down through the winter in the hopes that, you know, whenever they're ready, they'll, they'll move in there. And I was sort of fine with sparrows moving in. If anybody wanted it, it was theirs, you know, yeah. but now it sounds, I mean, I don't think I'm going to get in there and take their eggs out. Or, I mean, I, I didn't even, build it in a way that I can open it up, you know, <laughs> like, Oh I, yeah. You gotta, yeah. You want to be able to open up the side, you know, get one where you can act, you manage it, right. You, you have to manage these boxes. You can, you know, take out the old nesting material, which is full of mm, parasites and things. Just boy, a nest after a songbird has used it. It's just disgusting. <laughs> they don't songbirds don't reuse their nests. Uh, typically they'll either build a brand new one on top, uh, but it's better to clean out the old one. Okay. And songbirds that don't use boxes just build a whole new nest somewhere because, you know, their old nests are are gross. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a good tip that I, I got to make sure. Hopefully, somebody will move in, and uh, if they do, uh, when, when they yeah. uh, when they're done with it, uh, I will. Uh, when when is it okay and safe to clean it out? When are they done? Oh, you could you can clean it out. Now is a good time, in, you know, March. Bluebirds are starting so before, to- Okay, before the spring, just make sure to, to clean out last year's nest. Yeah, they're always okay. checking out. Birds that nest in cavities are always checking out the real estate. <laughs> kind of like, you know, kind of like we are. Yeah, you know, you're not in the market, but you're always kind of looking, you know. And they're always poking their heads into cavities um, and, and bird boxes. So have it ready um, in yeah. case bluebirds want to move in there. Mine, you never know what's going to be in there. The one that seems- to get used every year is the one that's closest to my house or right outside my bedroom window. That's where the tip mice nest. Right now it is chock full of flying squirrels, which are just maybe the cutest animal in, in Massachusetts. Yeah. <clears throat> um, if you've had them in your attic, you're probably saying, yeah, they're not so cute when they get into your yeah. attic. Um, but this is a very adorable nocturnal animal. It looks like those sugar gliders that people get as pets. Uh, but these are just as cute. And I have a, a bird box right now that's chock full of them. Hopefully they'll be done by the time the titmice uh, are ready to nest. The sparrows are using my upstairs neighbor's uh, dryer vent, uh, which they oh, good. seem to really enjoy. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, tons more questions here. Um, I love this question from Jerome. He says, if my feeders get emptied, the birds disappear. When I okay. refill them, the birds reappear very quickly. Do they find new food visually or by smelling the new food supply? Yeah, they're not smelling it. Very few birds can smell much, as far as we know. Um, Audubon and others sort of famously were wrong that no birds can smell anything. Um, vultures can smell. Seabirds have a really good sense of smell. They can navigate the ocean um, via scent maps. But the birds in your backyard can't really smell anything. And so it's visual. 
It's it's memory. It's constantly moving across the landscape, remembering places that they've had food before and checking them. Um, and so, yeah, that that's that's how they that's how they do it. Okay, a uh, couple of great questions from Chris here, who says. For the first time in 25 years, we had a male Carolina Wren singing his melodic song on our back deck a couple of weeks ago. Two questions here. One, is this early? And two, uh, we'd heard that Carolina Wrens tend to travel and gather in groups, but this was a sole bird. Is this unusual? No, they, they don't do anything in groups. Um, no. They don't move. They don't migrate. They're in your neighborhood year round. And so this is they're an interesting species. So they have moved north and presumably the milder winters that we see here as a result of climate change, there are winters are observably milder on average, on average. And that allows a non-migratory bird, like these various species that have moved north over the last century and, and more recently like cardinals and mockingbirds, titmice. These used to, the core of their range was much further south 150 years ago. and even more recent red-bellied woodpeckers. These are birds that don't migrate. So they're sensitive to this harshness of our winters. Mm. Uh, and so Carol getting back to Carolina wrens, a really bad snowy winter will knock their population way down. And then they have to build it back over the ensuing years because they're staying in your neighborhood as a pair um, year round. Okay. You know, we got so many great questions. I want to get to as many of them as we can. So can we, is it okay, Mark? Can we try like a lightning round? Like I'm, I'm going to just <laughs> yeah. fire a bunch of questions at you, fire the answers back, and yeah. we'll try and get through as many as we can right. to really touch on a lot of these subjects. So, all right, we're going to start with um, uh, Betsy from Reading wants to know, are there better or worse sources for backyard bird food, especially sunflower seeds? No. no. Oh, you want more? I'm sorry. I thought we were. <laughs> that, that was quick. My previous... No. <laughs> where, where, where do you get, where, where do you like to get them from? Bird bird food was that the question? Yeah, bird food, especially uh, she said, especially. Uh, yeah, I know we sort of covered that in the beginning. Like there there doesn't doesn't seem to be like premium level. Um, I think you can get it just about anywhere when it comes to the basics, like black oil, black oil sunflower seed and suet. Try suet from the butcher if you don't want to do the cakes. You get it at the supermarket. But. Okay. Um, Adam uh, has a question from his seven-year-old son. Arlo wants to know, I love this. How do birds' feathers change colors over the seasons? Right. The feathers themselves don't change colors. They change the feathers. And so that's a great question. And so almost all birds molt most of their feathers every year. Every feather on their body and wings gets replaced at some point during the year. Um, there are some patterns that develop through wear. Like if you see like red winged blackbirds this time of year, there might still be some rusty edges to the feathers, but that's something you see in the fall most, mostly. And those rusty edges wear away, physically wear away and makes them all black. But most birds are achieving different plumages by growing different, differently colored feathers seasonally for, for birds that, that do that. All right, lightning round, lightning round here. Uh, Jim, Jim, uh, we touched on this actually, but asks about uh, other techniques that birds use to survive the winter snow and cold. Well, that's a tough one for lightning round. Um, I thought I covered a lot of them. Uh, eating a lot, taking shelter from the wind, uh, flying south. <laughs> uh, those, those are some of the main ones. Um, okay. They have to find water. Water's, water's a big one. So knowing where there's like a spring that stays open um, and, and you know where there are water sources during deep freezes is really key. Okay. Uh, one of the guests wants to know how I can learn to identify birds by song, which I would love to know as well. Yeah. Um, it really takes time in the field, being interested in it, tracking down unknown birds and getting eyes on them. It, it, it really does take time and focus. But there are all these tools now. You can use the Merlin. I really highly recommend the Merlin app. It's a free, Merlin. all you can, uh, one-stop shopping birding app. It's a field guide and they've added, you can identify bird song automatically by holding it up. Something people have been waiting for, for years. Yes. And so press a button, like get into Merlin, download the song ID pack. Everything is free in Merlin. You Just can search download M -E -R -L -I -N packs. M-E-R-L-I-N and it comes Merlin, up. M-E-R-L-I. Okay. Um, and you can um, download packs for birding in Western Europe or Costa Rica. It works as like a nearly awesome. global field guide, but you can automatically identify songs. 
There are other apps that can help you learn bird song, like um, one called Lark Wire, Master Birder. Uh, but but they, just they time just in the put, field. They they did just put the link to the Merlin app in the chat. Actually, I see mm -hmm. that. So if people are interested all of in that, the apps, all of the field guide apps have songs and calls on them. Any awesome. of the ones you get, the Sibley one, whatever. Roos and Ricky say, after years of not seeing blue jays, we found flocks of them at our feeders this year. However, we've noticed fewer nut hatches. Are there, is there population swings that are happening right now? Yeah, there are always populations, ups and downs for all of the different birds. Red-breasted nut hatches are way down this year in our region because they stayed further north because there was more food further north. Blue mm. jays do the same thing. They will, if we didn't have a good acorn crop, then the blue jays would keep going and they would, wouldn't stop until they found a good acorn crop somewhere, the Ozarks, whatever. But if we have a good acorn crop, then you'll see more blue jays. So a lot of it is, is annual fluctuations based on food availability tied to Dana, trees. Dana says, uh, I think I'm saying her name right, hopefully, uh, says, always worried about robins when the ground is covered by snow, as it is today. Uh, I scatter raisins and grapes so they have something to eat. Uh, I know they eat berries from bushes, but anything else that I could offer them? Jeez, your robins are already eating better than my children. <laughs> Those are uh, so nice, you're, uh, you're doing yeah. pretty well, and I know people who do this with their cat birds in the summer. They get them, they come in to cut up, cut up grapes and things. That's getting a little bit boutique, you know. <laughs> it's, um, but they do fine. The robins just move around the landscape. They're they're big, strong songbirds. This is what they do. They flock up. They find. We have changed the landscape in a way that benefits robins. There are so many invasive plants out there, like multiflora rose um, and bittersweet, that uh, they can eat those fruits. And so they they do pretty well. Um, and then when the snow melts, they can get back to eating, you know, grubs and things that they they find in the grass. Okay. Uh, Aaron says, how important is it to use red bases in hummingbird feeders? We recently switched to a silver base with yellow flowers and they don't seem to be coming anymore. Is that, is that important to have a red one? Um, I don't know. I've never tested that. Um, I've had bird feeder, uh, hummingbird feeders. It doesn't have to be red. You mm. know, if they find it um, and they know about it as a food source, they'll keep coming. Um, that's a good question. I have not looked at like a published paper about their color preference for for feeders. Okay, I mean, it sounds anecdotally from from his experience there that uh, the silver one's not as popular. So maybe maybe yeah. switch back to the red. I guess there's a there's a data point. <laughs> Phil says asks you, Mark, if you've been following the saga of the Stellar's sea eagle. <laughs> have you heard about any current locations or movements from the Booth Bay Harbor main area? Yeah, I'm aware that it's up there. I've lost track of the sort of finer scale day to day of it. But there's a, if you know the GroupMe app, the birders are all on these um, GroupMe chats now for, there's a Massachusetts rare bird one mm -hmm. that tons of people got onto when the Stellar Sea Eagle was on the Taunton River. And now there's a main one. And you can go to like, um, just Google like main rare bird alert and you can find some updates on the Stellar Sea Eagle. But it is, seems to and have settled that bird, in, in I Maine. read about that, like, I think it's like the New York Times or something. Like it was a big deal. Where is that bird yes. supposed to be? Oh my, the, this is beyond lightning round. It's a it's a bird that should be in Japan right now. So they That's winter amazing. in the you know they breed in kind of coastal Siberia, and then it, they have a very small population. And then they um, the common place where people see them and photograph them in the winter is Japan. Um, and they're rare even in Alaska. I mean, Alaska is a stone's throw, relatively speaking, from their core population. But this is a bird that's rare even there. And this one made its way from Alaska, where it was photographed. It has a distinctive wing pattern. It was photographed in Alaska. It may have visited Texas, bizarrely. Uh, there was a photo of one down there. And then Eastern Canada, uh, the Canadian Maritimes, down to the Taunton River. And now it seems to have settled in in Maine. <clears throat> up there near Bath, and it, it it'll disappear for a few days, and then somebody has to like think of the main coastline, like all the yeah. different places where it could hide on yeah. the backside of an island or whatever, yeah. and then people refind it again. Yeah, but just an incredible bird. It if you see it in the in a tree next to a bald eagle, the bald eagle looks like a sparrow. 
I mean, it's just think of how big a bald eagle it's is, huge. and this is like its big brother. It's just much bigger. We have sort of more of a comment from Dinny, but I want to see if you if you can um, weigh in on this. Uh, yesterday's New York Times had an article about a new deadly bird flu in poultry farms, which is spreading in the wild bird population. It started in Delaware farm, but scientists are, are very worried about a significant uh, die off spreading north. Um, is this something you're concerned about? Have you heard about this? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a wait and see thing. Um, there are all these bird flus out there. Um, there, are, there are these zoonotics, these diseases that move through animal populations, as we well know, because when they jump to humans. Um, but yeah, this is something that people are monitoring. And there are a lot of folks who specialize in wildlife diseases and, and certainly domestic animals, uh, but also in wild animals. And they're tracking this. So, you know, stay tuned is, yeah. is what I would say on that. Okay, um, we have just a couple minutes left here, but uh, I, I love this question from Joan. I think it's it's maybe the most important question that we can talk about, which is, can you briefly talk about what the average person can do to help birds environmentally, uh, i.e. the use of plastic and, and what the impact is on the bird population? Um, a lot of people joining us today, what can each of us do to help birds environmentally? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things. Support, support your environmental organizations that that do the groundwork, support Mass Audubon, other other conservation organizations that focus on birds, um, and we'll do it for you. Uh, we're working on a variety of fronts, you know, combating climate change, which is impacting everything, um, to more immediate threats, acute threats to habitat. Um, you know, protecting land, you know, we're working on all of those fronts, restoring habitats that have been impacted by invasive species and past development, things like that. There are things you can do in your own yard, managing your landscape um, to benefit all wildlife and, and particularly like um, view yourself as an insect farmer and that will help songbirds. Keep your oaks, cherries, birches, look at Doug Tallamy's work um, on managing your yard to provide insects for breeding songbirds. It will benefit the bees, it will benefit birds. Um, you know, so reducing pesticides, planting native trees and shrubs, keeping the native trees and shrubs that are there already. Um, th these are things that collectively, when you think of the amount of land that is managed by suburban homeowners, if you mm. take that as a whole, it seems small, like you're doing little things in your yard that feel like micromanagement that aren't doing much. But the message gets out, there are more and more people finding each other on social media and doing these things. And then this becomes like a chain of national parks. If people are getting away from the, the sort of invasive species of plants that people use in their yards, you know, ivy and things like that, planting natives, using less pesticides, that kind of thing. Um, it can be a big deal collectively for wildlife. So these are things that everybody who has a yard um, can do in addition to supporting your conservation organizations. Okay. I think that that's a great note to end on and a, and a good reminder to us all that we have a, you know, a responsibility uh, to, uh, to the birds in our own backyard. You know, they, they bring us a lot of joy, but uh, there's things that we can do for them as well. Mark, this has been so much fun. Again, always so great to talk to you. Thank you for yep. coming and, and answering all of our questions. Uh, if people want to uh, follow you more, what's, uh, what are best places to find you on social media and, 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 and tell us about your, your various appearances on radio? Where, where can people uh, keep up with Mark? Follow me. That's creepy. Uh, no. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. <laughs> they want to follow. Uh, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so check out the the weekly bird report. Uh, certainly has a presence on Facebook. Um, that's it's through WCAI. Go to the WCAI uh, website or Facebook page, and then you can find the weekly bird report on there. You can do all, all of this stuff as a pod. A lot of people do podcasts. Um, and th these things are available as a podcast, the weekly bird report. I just learned it's the number 12 birding podcast in maybe the world. There were Australian ones on there and it's wow. very hyper-focused on the Cape and islands, but it was, it was number 12 up there with a lot of these kind of national scale radio shows and podcasts. So, um, I think so it's you the could... bird puns, actually, there's a lot of great bird puns. In, oh yeah. In, it's that, an that, untapped that, market in there. People yeah. who like dad, dad jokes about birds and, and bird puns. I, I'm glad I, yeah. I enjoy that. You don't shy away from that. So thank yeah, you. Great. I, I don't. And, and, I don't. and uh, Twitter, uh, you on, you on Twitter there? I'm not. <laughs> 
okay. but I think I, I'm trying to think if the bird, hopefully the weekly bird report is, and okay. certainly um, my day job is is Mass Audub working for Mass Audubon Cape Cod, here um, based out of Wellfleet Bay and also our Long Pasture Sanctuary, and certainly follow us on on social media follow mass audubon follow our our sanctuaries and um you can keep up with with some of that stuff there run instagram right. twitter all right Facebook. plenty of places to, to share uh, again okay. mark so much fun to talk to you today thank you so much and to everybody out there watching fantastic questions thank you so much for joining us please support uh wgbh wcai uh, and and public radio and, and public media in general. Um, and uh, and again, thank you for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions today, uh, but uh, but uh, keep tuning in because we'll do more of these because uh, there's lots to talk about. Um, again, Mark, thank you so much, and and everybody have have a great afternoon.